Hi, I'm Christian. I work on ZFS at Nutanix and today I'm going to present on a project that I did in the last year called Shared L2Arc. Before I get into the details, let me give a brief overview of what Nutanix Files actually is. So we are a software-defined scale-out file storage solution and the core functionality that we provide is NFS, SMB and multi-protocol shares that are accessed by clients and under the hood those shares map to ZFS datasets that are spread across many Z pools. And the architecture works like this. We have a compute part, meaning ZFS and the protocol servers. Those run inside VMs on top of the Nutanix hyperconverged infrastructure. And the, there is a storage part, meaning the VDEVs of each Z pool. Those are VDISCs, which is an abstraction that is also provided by the Nutanix hyperconverged infrastructure stack. And we access those VDISCs from the VM via iSCSI. Uh, each Z pool that we have in the system is imported in one VM at a given time, but the Z pools can move around between the VMs for purposes of HA or for load balancing. And moving around those Z pools is cheap because we just need to coordinate which VM owns a given Z pool at a given time. We don't need to move the data because the data resides somewhere in the hyperconverged infrastructure. We just consume it via iSCSI. Um, so the ZFS's role in this architecture is really not that of a, a physical volume manager, but instead it's a POSIX compliant file system with nice enterprise level features that we use to provide um, useful functionality to users. Now to the actual project uh, that sparked this shared l um idea. We had this project called Files Extended Buffer Cache and the goal with this project was to accelerate read heavy workloads whose working set exceeds the, the size of the arc of an individual compute VM. So the plan was to take a local disk of the VM's current host system and attach it to the VM. And then we would use that host local disk as an L2 arc inside the VM. And that would allow us to serve the reads from that local disk instead of having to go to the V disks every time we have an L1 arc cache miss. There were two problems with this. The first one was that if we add the host local disk as an L2 arc to the Z pools, then we can no longer move the Z pools around because uh, we now have this host local device attached to them. And what we wanted to avoid is to have a bunch of L2 arc add remove operations in the path of HA and load balancing uh, for various reasons. But the even more uh, severe problem was that the L2 arc is a per Z pool construct, but in our product, we cannot really predict which share or Z pool will need the acceleration the most. So because it's per Z pool, what we would need to do is take our local disk and partition it up to assign one partition to each local, uh, to each Z pool that is currently imported. But then if only one share or one Z pool is hot, then we would only use that partition and not use any of the other partitions because they're part of another Z pool. So that would lead to underutilization uh, in those cases and where it was, would actually be more attractive to just pool the entire capacity and as dynamically share it among the important Z pools. And then the Z pool that is currently hot could use all of the capacity. Before we get to the solution, let me give a quick recap on how the ARG works internally. So the ARG from a high level point of view maps cache tags, uh, which consists of the SPA load GUID, data virtual address, uh, and the transaction group of a given piece of data in the normal VDEVs. It maps those to a structure called ARG buff header T. Usually we refer to that structure as ARG headers. And that arc header points to the storage location of the cache data in the L1 and the L2 arc. In the L1 arc, the storage location is identified by a pointer to the DRAM buffer. So that's pretty straightforward. In the L2, 
the storage location is a pointer to the cache VDEV and the offset within the cache VDEV. Now, um, so much about data structures. How does this thing actually uh, fill up over time? There's a kernel thread called L2 arc feed thread, and that thread iterates over the L1 buffers that are eviction candidates of the L1 arc, meaning they are at the tail of the most recently used or most frequently used lists that the arc maintains. So we have our, our regular L1 buffers here, and then there are a bunch of eviction candidates, and this L2 arc feed thread iterates over those eviction candidates and applies the following rule. If the eviction candidate is from a Z pool that has a cache device attached to it, it will take that buffer and write it to the cache device and remember the location, meaning the offset and the VDEF ID in the, in the arc header. And now when it comes to eviction of the L1 header, then the, we will keep the arc header structure in the DRAM and, um, we will remember the offset in the L2 arc. So that when we later read that location, we will get an L1 miss because there is no longer an L1 buffer, but there is still the L2 header. We can get the data from the cache device and serve it to the user. And um, that's that's how the L2 arc works, works from a high level. Now let's see how this system behaves if we have multiple Z pools. Um, each ZPool requires its own cache device. Um, that is an invariant that upstream L2 arc currently imposes. So we have to supply a cache device to each ZPool. And then uh, the previous, the, the rule from the previous slide still applies. A cache device in a given ZPool will only host L2 buffers for that ZPool because that's what the L2 arc feed thread does right now. That means we have a mixture of buffers from the different Z pools, but the L2 arc thread partitions them by Z pool to the different cache devices of those Z pools. And that behavior can be desirable if the Z pools serve different workloads and we know that upfront and maybe we want to avoid some noisy neighbor problems or whatever. But in Nutanix files, we don't know upfront which Z pool um, will be the hot Z pool, or maybe there will be multiple equally hot Z pools or so on. We just don't know. So it's better to pool all the cache device capacity that we have and share it among all the Z pools. And that's what we did. So uh, with shared L2 arc, um, looks like this. We have the VDisk based Z pools, they just have normal, uh, normal type VDEVs. And then we have a special Z pool called Nutanix FSVM local L2 arc. That name is subject to review, obviously. And um, that Z pool only consists of the host local devices that we attach to the VM. Um, we partition these devices into two partitions, one fixed size P1 partition, and then the remainder of the device is P2 partition. The P1 partitions are put together in a mirror and they are constitute the normal VDEVs of this pool, and they are small. They are just enough to make the pool creation work, but they don't store any actual data apart from the meta object set and the uh, basic stuff that you get when you create a Z pool. The interesting part are the P2 partitions. Those are striped together as a cache device. And uh, so that alone would not be sufficient to do anything because the L2 arc feed thread um, still needs change. And so that's what we did. We took the L2 arc feed thread and changed it so that it no longer applies this rule where it partitions the, the buffers. Instead, um, we, cha we change it so that it feeds the buffers from any Z pool in the system to the L2 arc Z pool's cache VDEVs. So effectively, the buffers are now spread over those cache VDEVs. And that was really all we need to do to solve our problems and make this work. Now, the obvious question is, is this correct? I believe it is because we do, we do not make any changes to the arc or the L2 arc invariants themselves. 
the tagging remains the same, cache invalidation remains the same. Uh, all I can think of basically remains the same. There is one case where uh, we need to do uh, some minor changes. The fallback read case, um, that is the case where a read from the L2 uh, device fails, for example, because the L2 device is dead or there's a checksum error or uh, the buffer got evicted after we started the read, but before we finished the read, something like that. In those cases, we will go back to the primary pool and read the data from there. And that is fully transparent to the user. That's how the arc is supposed to behave. The problem here is that that primary pool might be exported while we're doing the L2 arc read, but uh, to make the fallback read, we need to guarantee that that doesn't happen. So the solution here was pretty simple. Uh, we just told the Spark config L2 arc log of both pools instead of the pool where we do the L2 arc read. And that solves our problems because this prevents the primary pool from going away as well. The other risk was that there might, like, because of because we are changing lifetimes of several data structures, there might be a risk of dangling pointers that we didn't identify. Uh, the primary risk that I had in mind was that we would have headers from the primary pool that reference uh, structures that are associated with the L2 arc pools. And that is new. Previously, all of these would be for the same Z pool and they would have the same lifetime. But now uh, that's no longer true. Um, they have different lifetimes because you can export the pools independently. So when we export the L2 arc pool, we will need to make sure that we invalidate all those arc headers. Well, it turns out that the code is already structured this way. So um, my understanding is that the existing code and locking is sufficient to deal with this. Uh, quick disclaimer, um, the basis for this design was the FSO Linux 0 0.7. So I know a bunch of things have changed in the meantime in the arc, and we didn't take those into consideration when we designed this. Um, so that was it uh, about where the project is right now. Let's talk about the future. Uh, right now, the project is a proof of concept. It hasn't been productized yet. And um, what I did was publish the rebased code um, to GitHub. So it's available as a draft PR. And every one of you can look at it and check it out. There are a bunch of to-dos. Uh, first of all, I did the rebase, but I didn't take the new features into consideration. So for a general design, we'll need to think about how we handle these. And then obviously we cannot use this hard-coded magic name. We need some more dynamic and generic representation of uh, whether the l devices should be shared or not. Uh, a property seems like the right choice for this. Maybe something like this, share a 2 arc VDEVs on or off would control uh, sharing of the a 2 arc VDEVs for the 2 arc C pool. And if you want, um, we also want to deal, like we want to support both the non-shared and the shared a 2 arc case. So probably we should also have a property that controls whether we want to use the shared a 2 arc in a given Z pool or whether we only want to use the uh, that Z pool its cache devices for data set for data sets in that pool. So another property uh, that we could throw in. That is all subject for debate. I would be happy about comments on the PR or in the Q and A right now. And that was my talk. If you're interested in the code, have a look at the PR, or we can uh, look at it together in the breakout session or during the hackathon. And if you want a demo, maybe we can also do that during the uh, in the breakout room after the talk. If you have questions or comments on the design, now is the time. And before I hand over to Matt, I would like to say thank you uh, to my team at Nutanix and uh, the ZFS community at large, in particular, Paul Danielli and George Wilson. Uh, both of you answered lots of questions that I had um, while I while I implemented this. Thank you. So Q and A, cool. All right, <coughs> questions for Christian. 
Alan? Is there a reason you decide? can you explain the reason you decided to use a separate pool rather than making an l 2 be in two pools at once, kind of like a spare can? Yeah, um, so that was actually one of the alternative designs. Um, it was just too fiddly uh, in the like VDEV management code. I wasn't particularly familiar with that. Actually, under the hood, the VDEV auxiliary T, which is like the, the I don't know, you could call it abstract base class or whatever, basically a, a piece of code that is shared between spare VDEVs and uh, L2Org VDEVs. Spare VDEVs support being present in multiple pools at the same time. But I found the whole, like, that, that the, at the point in time where you put the spare into actual use, I found all of that pretty messy and didn't want to deal with that. Um, so yeah, I chose the separate pool approach. Also, you have to like um, think about what the different subcommands will do. So for example, a ZPool status will it, or a ZPool IO stat, will it show the IOs for the device for each pool or uh, will it like distribute the statistics based on which pool access did, did how many accesses to this device? Uh, it seems simpler to just have one, one Z pool. Um, so if you have a couple pools imported on the system, you know, pool A and pool B share this L2 arc, and then you go and say export pool A, um, does it go and immediately like reclaim all the space that pool A was using in the L2 arc, or does it like persist in case you are going to import pool A again later? Uh, yeah, so as I said, we are on uh, 0 0.7, <clears throat> so we don't have persistent L2 arc, and uh, I think that would so, so, so we don't we don't have that particular use case. In general, when we export the pool, it's going to be gone for several minutes, and by then the L2 or contents are probably irrelevant. So um, yeah, we didn't need to think about that. We thought about okay, upstream the persistent L2 arc. Are we interested in persistent L2 arc for the product? And yeah, we concluded that <clears throat> that we aren't. So that's why we didn't look at this. Other questions? All right, looks like no. Cool. Thanks a lot, Christian. Thank you.